And forecasters are predicting an above average hurricane season for the U.S. This hurricane season could be getting ready to become massive. Normally we get 14, so 19 would be way above the 30 year average. You're going to want to watch this because this is going to be a big hurricane season here. Out into the central Atlantic, everything very quiet. We've seen this, what, for weeks upon weeks. Just nothing going on, hardly a cloud in the sky. It's quiet. A little too quiet. With the official Adjuster TV start of the 2022 hurricane season, as of August 17th, 2022, we have had, drum roll please, a whopping three devastating tropical storms this year so far. Three. By this time last year, we were already down to H in the names with Category 1 Henri, which was the third hurricane of the season. That said, Category 4 bruiser Ida blew up south of Cuba as a tropical storm on August 26th, and within a very short three days made landfall in Louisiana with 150 mile an hour sustained winds. Things can happen very quickly this time of year, and that is why I always say that hurricane season doesn't officially start for Cap property adjusters until the middle of August. The peak of hurricane activity will come mid-September and effectively be over by Thanksgiving. As catastrophe adjusters, we also know that no matter what the eggheads say, Mother Nature is going to do what she wants to do. And even though they're predicting 20 to 22 storms this year, we could have like a half a dozen, or we could have another record-breaking year. The bottom line here is that anything can happen, and if you want to be in this game, you've got to be ready to get sent to the coast with 24 hours notice if it gets real. Or, if nothing happens, to accept that not every season will have huge hurricanes that send tens of thousands of claims adjusters to the coast to help with the recovery. In this video, I talk with experienced adjuster Steve about his experiences on his first hurricane and how you can be ready to deploy or not, starting now. You're watching Adjuster TV, adjusters first. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Kaplik. Learn all about E&O and other insurance for adjusters at cplic.net slash adjuster TV and by Adjuster TV Plus. Get unlimited access to a growing library of the best adjuster training videos created by the most trusted name in claims, Adjuster TV at adjustertvplus.com. Hey, Matt here, and welcome to Adjuster TV, where I share my more than 20 years of experience as a cat property IA to help you build a rewarding career as an independent adjuster so that you can help people during natural disasters and earn a great living doing it. And here's my chat with Steve. Tell me a little bit about yourself and, and kind of, you know, where you're at in your journey and what you've been, you know, what your experience has been with claims and, and uh, kind of what your, you know, what your thoughts are for, you know, some, maybe some advice for new people. Yeah. Um, honestly, I just heard about your, uh, your show, your YouTube channel and, uh, the Facebook group from a friend of mine, uh, an adjuster that works up in, uh, in Boston. And once I saw it, I'm actually trying to get my brother-in-law involved right now. He's like new to the whole insurance adjusting, but he's not new to like, you know, the industry. He's actually owned right. his own home inspection business for about seven years. So he's, I mean, the understanding of like, you know, damage and identifying materials, he has no problem with his uh, whole thing is just going to be getting started, getting experience with Xactimate and whatnot. Um, so when I saw your website and, and your YouTube channel, I wish I had this when I first started because it's incredibly informative. It's, yeah. I mean, they have all kinds Me of too. videos. That's why you I have, did it. <laughs> what you're doing is fantastic and you're really helping a ton of people. So I was very impressed. Um, I've, I think I found it about a month ago. And uh, I've just been like, you know, trying to catch up on it because even me, I've done it for, I started in 2017. I watched the uh, first video of you and Dion and he was explaining his start. Yeah. And it's like, it's the exact same way I got started. Everybody went to Dallas and like Houston because of Hurricane Michael. And then nobody was there for Irma. And my brother is yeah. the one who got me involved. We both grew up in construction, you know. You know, waking up at 5 a.m., destroying our bodies, doing flooring, you know, roofing, anything you can do. We just, you know, we worked hard. We, we were from Boston. And then he got involved um, about 10, 11 years ago just because he saw people up on a roof and he just, you know, wanted to know what the heck they were doing. So he just started asking. And that's how he discovered insurance adjusting. So he's been an IA for about 11 years. Uh, he wow. got me into it and he got me into it in about uh, 2017. He made me a bet that I wouldn't be able to pass the test. 
um, just the insurance adjusting uh, course. And I, you know, I had time, so I said, why not? So I did it. And then when Hurricane Irma came, he was like, you got to come down. There's crazy money to be made. And at that yeah. point, I had not even done a claim, not one single claim. And then, you know, again, same story as Dion. We went down, you know, didn't sleep for about a month and came back with a ton of experience and a lot of money. And then, of course, um, I kind of took I was doing construction full time. So then after I got back, I probably took off about 11 months and just did, you know, construction again until I got back into doing some day work for uh, insurance adjusting. And like you said, it, it was kind of a wake up call because I went from making dumb money to be, you know, all of my estimates were really terrible because I was brand new. I had no experience. And then I come back and I did my first claim and they were picking apart everything. I had revisions, you know, for at least a day straight, just trying to figure out how to like relearn everything I, I did in, uh, in uh, Florida. So it was a little right. bit different. But then from then on, you just keep getting more experience and you keep getting more work and you just try to figure it out. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk a little bit about Irma. Um, you know, I, I, Irma is kind of like, I would say, sort of the, the, the modern version of Katrina. And maybe Katrina yeah. was sort of like the 2005 version of Hurricane Andrew. Like when people like, you know, oh, I got everybody you talk to, like get their start on Irma or Katrina or Andrew. Um, so tell me about kind of like what you what sort of claims you were doing on on Irma and like, um, you know, you don't have to say how much you made, but maybe kind of talk about like what, what was going on with the fee schedules. Well, the fee schedules were outrageous because they needed all the help they could get. And so they were giving yeah. out emergency uh, licenses to anybody that wanted to come down. Um, and I have no problem saying what I made because why not? I mean, that's the whole reason we're in this business is to make money. Um, and when my yeah. brother told me to come down, he was telling me like numbers that just didn't make sense. I mean, I went from construction where I killed myself 15, 16 hours a day and maybe making three or $400. So he's like, yeah, he's like, I probably am making at least a grand or two a day. And I'm like, all right, okay. And this is sure. my brother we're talking about. He's like one of the closest people I like. I'm like, there's no way anybody's gonna pay anybody a thousand dollars a day, let alone 2000 or 3000. And he's just like, just come down, try it out. I was like, and again, this is somebody that I trust a lot. And I still was super skeptical. And I went down, I think I spent the first week just shadowing him, just trying to figure it out. Like, what am I doing? Am I gonna screw up? Am I gonna get arrested? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> and I completed about 45 claims and probably made around 30 grand in my first month. Um, and then from there it was like, all right, well now I'm hooked because even if I only do this once a year for one storm, you know, I, at the yeah. time I was a single guy, I didn't mind traveling. I'm like, this is a no brainer for me. Um, and again, that was like, yeah, that was quite an anomaly because we haven't had a storm like that. Um, I mean, Hurricane Ida was close, but nothing like that fee schedule. I think the fee schedules were like five to six times the normal rate. And since there was so much damage and so much going on, the revisions were nothing. They didn't have any time to revise it. So the insurance companies were just writing checks. So I'd write an yeah. estimate for like $35,000. I'd get, I'd be identifying wrong materials, wrong shingles, you know, wrong size fascia. None of it mattered just because they didn't have time to evaluate and, and check it out. So they just were writing checks. Yeah, it was, it was a bit of a cluster. That's for sure. Oh yeah. I'm sure the cleanup for, Ir for Irma was probably, I can't even imagine. Um, but you mm -hmm. know, I mean, I think, you know, just for, for clarification for anybody who's watching this, who's like, you know, well, they're doing everything wrong and they're getting paid. What we're doing is we're getting a check in the insurance hand, like as fast as possible. And that's the reason why, <clears throat> the reason why they, they threw so many warm bodies at, at, at storms like at, at Hurricane Irma and that they do this for a lot of most hurricanes. I think this ends up happening with is because there's a kind of a, Primarily is because if, if I'm a homeowner and I live on the coast and my house gets leveled or damaged by a hurricane, I need to have the adjuster there because I need to start getting the repairs done, right? So the contractors uh -huh. are all, they're knocking on the doors or whatever, and their contractor's like, well, where's your adjuster? Where's your adjuster? And this is within the first week to, you know, first few days up to a couple of, you know, few weeks. Um, mm -hmm. So they have to have people there to start giving those guys money. And the understanding that the carrier has is that no matter what, they know that they're going to be paying more on all those claims, but they just want to get some money in people's hands. And so they're, they're putting 
like lesser trained people out there. Right. Well, so that's, they have to, that's, otherwise... the, that's the only people that are available. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Hurricane Irma uh, was, you know, outrageous. But even when we had uh, Ida, I was getting claims that I was booking people a month up, you know, and they just need boots on the yeah. ground. And of course, they can always go back and revise it after and be like, all right, well, this and they supplement and they change it all out, which is, you know, what they do do. They spend, you know, six, seven months catching up after a storm. But at least they yeah. get boots on the ground because they need to take care of their customers. And a lot of times it's their name on the line. If you're enjoying this video and you're ready to take the next step and learn how to start adjusting claims, then check out my step-by-step -step video training called The Road to the Storm at adjustertv.com slash start. This training is totally free and includes not only a complete series of training videos, but a PDF guide that includes a ton of career resources to go along with it. Jumpstart your career right now at adjustertv.com slash start so how many hurricanes have you done in your career so so now um i've probably traveled for the storms about i've probably done about eight storms now uh i was lucky because i lived in boston for pretty much most of my life i just moved to nashville three months ago with my fiance and i did all nice. my work mostly day claims up in boston and then when hurricane uh ida just came through a lot of the damage was in New York and Connecticut and New Jersey. And, um, you know, those were water claims, the, the, you know, water losses. So I stayed yeah. up there for a month and worked that. And then I went down to Louisiana for a month. Uh, but I've gone out to Houston. I've gone to Tampa. I've gone to areas of Georgia. Um, and now I'm in Tennessee. So I've traveled quite a bit uh, for these storms. And again, it's really hard to to not take these storms, even if you have to live somewhere for a month where you don't know, you just, you know, shack up in a hotel. You know, me and my brothers used to get uh, hotel rooms, you can split the cost, and then you just work yeah. nonstop. And you make, yep. you know, sometimes you can make a year's salary in less than a month. Yeah, yeah, so t so kind of talk a little bit about the lifestyle, the, the, the cat lifestyle. Well, like I said, when my brother first got me involved, I didn't think the money was real. I'm, you know, I'm just like, it, it, but, the more experience you get, that's the best part about this industry is whatever you're going to put into it is what you're going to get out. Now, it's not yeah. for everybody for sure, because it's not a nine to five. But if you really want to work hard and you want to learn, you can just get quicker and better. And you're able to like, you know, work for better firms and get better uh, fees. But um, so when we went on storm, my first month was just anarchy. I, I didn't sleep much. I was just chugging coffee and doing nothing but trying to learn and like shadow people that knew what they were doing. And then now that I've got some experience, I mean, I went down to Dallas uh, for the when they had those crazy hail and windstorms last March. And I spent a month there just, you know, you get a hotel room or an Airbnb and everything is like, you know, you're paying for all your own expenses. So I usually drive my own truck. I have all my own materials, my ladders, my tools. And then I just, you know, get an Airbnb and just work nonstop. And again, I have my fiance back home that doesn't enjoy having me go on the road for a month or two at a time but right. again it's really hard to toss up that money because then i can take off a month or two if i want oh yeah for sure so how do you handle uh like do you just go through the drive through all the time or do you have do you bring a hot plate or you stay at stay bridges i usually or like, bring an air fryer and i just go okay. to the grocery store and just just pick up a ton of chicken and like hamburgers and you can do those in the, like I have a whole, I had hotel rooms and stuff and you can cook them in there just at a low temp. You're not allowed to, but it doesn't create smoke or anything like that. And that's the right. cheapest and healthiest way to do it. But yeah, a lot of people, unfortunately you don't have, you know, your, your favorite gym on the road or you don't have a lot of like uh, fast food places that are even around. When we went to the storm in Georgia, we were in a, uh, an area that had no power for like three or four weeks. So we were traveling like yeah. 45 minutes just to the town to do the claims with no cell reception, no phones, like you couldn't use anything and then just doing our inspections and then driving an hour back and getting all of our work done at the hotels. So it's not always like, you know, it's a, it's a lot more difficult when you hit storms and people lose power and whatnot. Yeah. Now have you, since, since you kind of started, you kind of like were sort of like trial by fire, it sounds like. But have you, since then, have you sought out any like like formal training or gone to any like IA schools or anything? 
Yeah. So once once I got my start and um, I that was my like intro in 2017 and I kind of did both. I did construction because that was my main source of income at the time. And I would just do insurance adjusting when I was slow. And then as I got better at insurance adjusting, uh, that started to take over more and more to the point where in 2018 and 19, I was doing like half and half. And again, right off the bat, they're not going to take inexperienced people. So at that point, I started going into getting the exact uh, level one trainings and the level two trainings. And then I'd get the USAA certifications and, and just try to like hone in on all my skills because I don't want to be at the next storm and take me, you know, an hour to sketch a, a floor plan or a roof right. or something, you know? So, I mean, the money that you can make is significant, but you need to be quick and fast and proficient. Because if you're writing estimates that are just complete nonsense, you're going to get kickbacks all the time. And that's just wasting all your time, you know? Yeah, for sure. So so for somebody who is who's maybe like stumbling on this kind of like you did, um, what kind of advice would you give them for starting out that maybe that you would have done differently? Well, for starters, you definitely have to, you have to put in the work because it's going to take, it's a, it's a huge learning curve. I was already pretty decent with computers and I already had the whole construction aspect of it, but learning the Xactimate programming and entering your line items and sketch and all that stuff, that just takes time. And there's only so much shadowing you can do. Like my brother-in-law is getting involved. He's came on a few inspections with me and he's wrote like one estimate, but like he, he understands all of everything that is entailed, but it's the program itself running Xactimate that is the most difficult. So for that, Adjuster Pro is awesome because they have a ton of, nowadays you can watch your videos, your YouTube channel. You can go to, um, um, Adjuster Pro has a lot of, uh, you know, trial errors and, and things you can do to try to like, you know, figure out the estimates and they can like do like pre-estimates and like all practice stuff that you can like start to get your skills but the best way to do it is to just go and shadow people so the only way i figured i'd, I'd do it is i would hound my brother and i'd be like i'll be your driver for a month and just drive you around and just watch what you do and watch him do the inspections and take the photos of the elevation and then go on the roof and just literally buy him coffee and like be his intern is basically yeah. what I did. And then I do the same thing to other adjusters in the area. And they, uh, right now, again, I'm about four or five years into this. If I had a driver, I'd be psyched because they can drive me around and I can inspect, which only takes about a half hour and then write the report that takes about two. So if I have a lot of driving, I can just hire a driver. And that's that's usually how I get people involved. I'm like, you know what, I'll pay you $100 to drive around and then they see what you're doing and they learn that way, you know? Yeah, for sure. So are you willing to take on, and you could say no, are you willing to take on like people that job shadow you for a few days Absolutely. or a week? 100%. I don't know. Because it's funny, again, the way I learned was kind of just trial and error. So every time I go on, I'll still go on ride-alongs with adjusters just because I want more knowledge. I want to know what they're doing and how like, a lot, everybody has their own preferences. And then also other firms like, you know, USAA and Nationwide and Pure, they all do things differently. So if I'm doing a pure claim and I'm not even sure how to do them, I want to go with an adjuster that's a staff adjuster or an IA that's done it like 150 pure claims so that I can know their procedures because everybody's got their own, you know, special way to do it. And you won't know if you're bouncing around. So absolutely. I mean, I've had people, uh, when you go down on storms, obviously you meet a ton of different people. And I still have phone numbers of people I met at Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Ida, all these places that I still would just call up and be like, hey, I just had a quick question. Is there any way I can just pick your brain? Because again, there's so much learning and like you could be in this 30 years and still learning because the industry is always oh, yeah. changing as well, you know? Big time, big time. Um, so now do you, um, who do you, who are you, like what firms have you worked for? Or like who's, do you have like a main firm that you always work for? So right now I'm working for AllCat, um, and they're they're a pretty large company. Um, I started off with uh, BSA, and that was just for the storm. And then when I got back to Boston, I started working for PLS and AllCat. And again, uh, when I first started working for some of the IA firms, they were super busy. And I think they kept me busy for a year, and then all of a sudden they just lost contra uh, contracts with their uh, insurance companies, and then they went dry, and I had no work from them. And so I kind of bounce back and forth. That's the beauty of being an IA. You just kind of go where the work is. Uh, now, someone like AllCat, I've been with AllCat for years, and they're fantastic. 
Again, they cover probably about 20 different insurance companies at this point, but everybody works together. It's, I mean, I've never had, I've never had uh, an issue getting in touch with any of my managers, any of my team leads, and they're always there to help you. So, um, you know, they'll call me up and be like, Hey, I have this claim brand new firm, you know, you want to do it. I'm like, absolutely. Just cause I want to learn. And then I'll call them sure. and be like, all right, I don't know how, what am I supposed to do here? Like, how do I write it up be, in their terms? Because again, everybody has their own preferences and you always need to learn. But, um, we decided, my fiance and I decided to move to Nashville four months ago. And I used to only work in Boston. That's where I lived my entire life. So I had no idea. So I just called all cat. I'm like, Hey, I'm going to go to Nashville. Um, and like kind of live there. Is there any way I'd be able to get work? And they're like, yeah, sure, absolutely. Let me know when you get there. I've been working almost every day since I got here just because they're so big. And I guess Nashville's a big area and there's not that many adjusters. Nobody wants to be an adjuster anymore, it sounds like. Yeah, no, there's a, and I've have, I've had every IA firm that I've ever I've spoken with this about in the last few months have complained about a, we're calling it a talent crisis. It's the same mm, reason why, yes. you know, the, you know, the Ford service center can't find techs for their shop and Taco Bell can't find people yeah. to make tacos and work the drive through. Same nobody deal is, is happening to us. Nobody, I don't know how they're not working, but nobody wants to do it. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. Um, but quick question for you. So would you rather um, work for a company that had a great fee schedule but had like kind of a complicated sort of like workflow. They had a bunch of compliance stuff that they wanted you to do, or maybe uh, a really kind of a lighter one, maybe like that's 20% less than that, where it's like, hey, just estimate photos, send it up. It depends, because, um, well, it depends. If you're working for one firm, then it doesn't matter how many procedures they have. Once you do a bunch of them, you kind of get the whole rhythm down. So it just becomes like repetitious at that point, you know, because yeah. like I've, I've done this point, I've probably done about 400 USAA claims. Now they might not be one of the better paying fee schedules, but I can bang them out real quick as opposed to some of the other ones that would take me so long because I don't know their procedures, you know? Um, yeah. But really whoever has the most work is where I want to go. Because again, you it's, our entire industry is usually based around customer service. You know, you have to plan your schedules out with the customer and make sure that they're the priority and kind of like set them up on your schedule, even though you want to make sure that they think that they're the priority, you know, and you also don't want to Comcast and be like, yeah, I'm going to be there on Wednesday and not give them a, like, you know, a right. window. It's between eight and five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're, they're, so they're kind of like, and then, but you also don't know, sometimes it says wind damage and you show up and the house is gone. It's just leveled. It's like, okay, well, yeah. this is going to take a little longer than something else, you know? So you kind of have to like gauge it. But whoever has the most work is kind of the ones I go after. And again, all cats, since they cover so many different firms, they have so many different uh, areas that you can grow. It's such a big company. It's And they take care of you. They really do. So that's kind of what yeah. I like to go after. Yeah. And you make a good point too. And cause you see on social media where people are like, you know, well, if somebody's going to call me, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask about the split or I'm going to ask about the fee schedule or mileage or whatever. And it's like, I, it's a, I say no matter what, if, if, especially if you're brand new, go. Just, yes, I'm going. It doesn't matter what the pay is. It just, or if it doesn't matter if you're paying I, I don't even think I asked about any fee no. schedules. My first like couple years, everybody that called me, they're like, hey, you want to take this claim? Yes, I do. I don't care what it is. And a lot of them, some of these firms, they know that. They know that they're, you're going to get in, inexperienced adjusters that you don't have to pay. I've had some claims that I've spent over 60 hours and been paid like $125, you know? You're going to get those at the beginning just because you don't know any better, you know? So there's certain yeah. firms that I won't even mention who they are, but I'm not, I'll never work with them again just because they're so terrible. And they don't, you know, they just, they don't take care of their customers. They don't take, take care of their uh, adjusters and they don't pay well. You know, so I, I'm just like, no, they're just kind of like on my blacklist. Like, and my managers know never to like give me those because it's just not worth it for me. You know? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I think that's that's something that takes a little a level of experience. You know, you can't just really like, again, I mean, it's brand new. You can't be like, well, no, because I don't, you know, yeah. I don't want to work W2 or I don't want to work 1099 or I don't want to work hourly or daily or whatever it is. Just go. Experience is the exactly. most important thing. And, you know, the reason I asked that question is like about the, you know, 
the the higher fee schedule versus the lower fee schedule um, is because people that's a big thing that people talk about on social media. You know, well, so, such and such, you know, their their fee schedule sucks. Well, maybe, but it's it's not app. Maybe it's not apples to apples. Maybe it's apples to oranges, right? Because maybe it's maybe you can do seven of those super easy in a day, whereas you struggle to do four of the other one in a day. You're getting paid more, but you know you're going to to bed, you know, early with the other one, and you don't have a bunch of headaches, and and uh, it's 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 kind of relative. But you brought up that kind of that third facet, which is it really doesn't matter what the procedure is, or what the compliance is, is it's, it's just part of the, what am I doing next? That's what I'm doing next. Right. And in, in your claims workflow, I tell people this and they don't believe me, but it's true. When I first started, I went and worked for pilot doing state farm claims and state wow. farm has, I don't know if they do it now, but they ha- back then they had um, what they called RTs or like they called it a reinspector trainer. And they, I went out and shadowed them and worked with them for two weeks. I got, somebody to train me i'd already gone to Vale and like did the three-week program and like did all everything mm-hmm. that everybody's doing before they ever handle a claim but you get on the, your first storm and you just it's it's like you said the learning curve is like this even if you're a, a level three exactimate you know and all that stuff um and they were like they wanted us to close every carrier if, you, if, if they write checks or if they're like, you know, they want you to settle up on site. They want you to be able to have a conversation with the homeowner. Some of them don't, mm-hmm. but, you know, but I think, you know, for the most part, like if you're given full claims, they want you to handle the whole thing. Um, and mm-hmm. these guys were like, close it on site, close it on site. And this is back when we had a paper file and Polaroids. I had to staple Polaroids onto a piece of paper and write down the label of the picture. I had to write out my activity uh-huh. diary. I, had, I wrote checks, had to register, had to fill out the register for the checks. You know, we, I had Xactimate, so I printed out three copies of the estimate and then I had to fold up two of them. One went to, or one of them, one went to the, the agent, right? And then one was for the insured and one was for the file. All that stuff. And I could still do eight hail claims a day, closed on site wow. a day. It took me a little while to get up to get up to it, but it was I do this, then I do this, then I do this. I have a rhythm, went around the building exactly the same way every single time. And you you have like a system, right? And then it doesn't matter what goes in the system. The next year, the next cat, well, hey, listen, you know, we're doing something different with the cover sheets on our TPS reports and da da da. And then okay, well, then I just incorporate that into my system. Everybody else is belly aching. I I can't believe how many F9 notes I gotta put in here. This is BS. It's, it's gonna be more F9 notes than line items just make a macro with the F9 notes in it and move on. It's like, so I don't know. You bring up, that's a, that's a really good point as far as like, uh, you know, it's part of your workflow. So do you feel like, you know, coming from where like you started and doing 45 claims in a month, which is not bad for a first event, but you know, I'm sure you're doing more than that. If you were went back in time and did that same storm again, you'd probably be doing double that. Right more like triple or quadruple because I, yeah. I had no clue what I was doing. Um, and again, for instance, when we went down to Hurricane Ida, I was only there a month, uh, but my brother was there two months and he's got about, like I said, four or five years on top of me. So his experience, I feel like is still like light years ahead of me. I feel like I have a ton to learn and I can only get faster and better. And, you know, people like him and people that have been in the industry, probably like you and, you know, 15 years experience, you hit a storm like Ida, you can probably make 200 grand in a couple months, you know, Um, or more. Um, You know, like I said, my brother's only about 10, 11 years. And I think he cleared probably just over 150 in two months. Um, And then uh, since I worked part up in Boston and then, you know, some New York, and then I was doing some driving around and I went to Louisiana still, I think I cleared over 85 in two months. Um, So like, again, being an independent, as long as you're willing to work and just put in the hours, you know, you don't want to take a day off because you take a day off. It's like, I'm making a grand or two a day. Why would I take a day off? Like, right. what am I going to do? I'll relax in a month. Like who cares? So it's definitely a lot of work and obviously it's mentally fatiguing and, and it's a drain because you're not, you're not really taking care of yourself when you're on the road, but it's like, you know, what would you rather have? I'd rather work like hell for a month or two straight and then take off a couple of weeks, you know? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And that's one of those things like it, depending on the, the, the type of event, 
Like if it's a a, a big hurricane, um, and it's one of your like my first my first five years as an adjuster, I started in '99. First five years, mm-hmm. I was I didn't do a, a single hurricane. There weren't really any hurricane. I mean, there were some, but they were little. Or I was like, I was already really really dug into a hailstorm. It's somewhere in the Midwest, and a claim is a claim, right? I mean, granted. Mm-hmm. You know, you lose the opportunity to get like the the ninety to one hundred ten thousand dollars months like people had on Irma, um, mm-hmm. just stick, staying on your hailstorm. Hail is always my favorite thing to do because it's it's a uh, uh, not everybody knows right away that they have hail damage, right? So they like, uh-huh. you know, they may not find out that they could have a hail claim for several weeks or a month or two or three months after the storm when the, the contractors start rolling through or they see their neighbor get the finally that they got the the contractor lined up and they're getting the roof put on so so historically and i don't know what it's like exactly these days but hail storms were always like my bread and butter and i was like i knew that if i got sent to des moines or omaha or kansas city or st louis or minneapolis or whatever that on, on two and a half inch hail that's where i'm up that's where I'm going to be for the rest of the summer. Cause I'm going to lock into that and just like, um, so, you know, as verse to, um, as opposed to like a hurricane where it, it may be, you know, everybody knows they have catastrophic damage and the first few waves of adjusters mm-hmm. may be in and out, you know, relatively quickly. Um, but you get in, you know, kind of like snuggle into your hotel and you got your, you know, if you, if you stay at a stay bridge or you're staying with buddies and you like, like, where our favorite place to stay was like stay bridges because you could get like they'd have like a two bedroom suite and you yep. know or the extended stays that you have like a little kitchenette yeah so you got a little kitchenette you know and i bring along like a nice uh like a nice non-stick skillet and cook eggs and steaks mm-hmm. and things like that in it and just you know that was kind of the way i would go but then you'd get like super stressed out or if you're in the car all day long like on hurricane mm. katrina um like you said like the my claims were in Mrs. like the western side of Mississippi where all my claims were for mm-hmm. on Katrina and the closest place that I could find to stay was two hours away and so it's a four hour yeah. commute round trip and at least a half an hour of that in the afternoon is getting all the love bugs off the front of the, car, the truck because they're <laughs> they had a brand new truck of course you know and those things I mean they disgusting like they dissolve your paint anyway so then it's like, well, and the last thing I want to do it, at nine o'clock at night when I get back to my RV, which is what I had back in, on Katrina, is make dinner. So mm-hmm. I'm eating dinner on the way home, and it's you know, it's from a it's from a sack, you know, the drive through. Um, yeah, yeah. And the nice things about the storms is, like you said, if you're doing hail and you're doing hail every single day. It becomes yeah. super repetitious. Same thing with yeah. wind or same thing with water. You already, and again, you set up your tree and your Xactimate. So it's like, oh, is that a laminate chingo roof? Copy and paste. And you put everything in there. So we, like, yeah. we set up our little uh, trees so that we have everything in there. You have the shingles remove, fell, drip, you know, ridge vents. And I just list all of the vents so that what I could do is copy everything and just click on which ones aren't there. If there's no turtle vents, just yeah. get rid of it. If there's no ridge cap, you know, delete it. And, and, then you're writing up your estimates and it's taking you half the time because you're doing it nonstop. And then you, again, you can just close as many as you possibly can, as long as you're awake, you just keep working. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And again, I mean, it's like you said, like as far as like taking a day off, I didn't, I didn't really usually take days off until I sort of was forced to. And that was when there just wasn't enough volume. Like I'm just ran out of stuff to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take Sunday off. Right. And then Monday Mm -hmm. rolls around and they drop 15 more claims in my queue and, off to the races again but yeah. if it's it, it, or if it rained like if i knew that I, I needed to take a day off and it was like just thunderstorming and pouring the first thing in the morning mm-hmm. and i would check the radar and i'm like in an hour i gotta get up and make some phone calls to, to like reschedule these but i'm taking today off and i'd go i mean if it wasn't thunderstorming i'd go play golf in the rain or you know go see a movie or <laughs> yeah <laughs> just to like yeah. do because you know I you mean, don't want to take a day you, off you have and then to. like yeah, you do. You do. But you don't want to like have like your day off be like the day that you're doing laundry and taking getting a deal to the dentist or going to get an oil change and things like that. You just want it to be a day off of everything. Mm-hmm. So I would try to plan in. I would try to do like in, build into my schedule, especially if it starts to lighten up towards like the middle or the like the end ish of a storm. 
They're like, all right, well, I'm going to get my oil changed after this two o'clock and put it in my schedule or, you know, go to the grocery store or whatever. Right. And then a day off was like a complete day off. That's the day that you go to happy hour the the, the evening before with your buddies because, you know, you're not going to have to get up the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we when we were in Item, both my brothers were down there. So there was three of us and we just rented a house. And it was like everybody worked every single day. But by like Sunday around, usually around like two or three, we wouldn't schedule inspections later. And like one of my brothers would pick up a bunch of steaks and we'd just get some beers and like still be working. But like it was kind of like a day off. It felt like yeah. a day off because instead of working till like 10 o'clock at night, I actually got to stop around like two and just like label photos or something and eat steaks and have a couple of drinks. So that was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you, you don't write your claims up on site? Do you, you like go out and scope and take them back to the hotel? So it depends. Um, if, if I'm on storm, then what I'll do is I'll inspect and literally just sit in the car, go right around the corner and write it up right then. Because if you miss a photo, you can always just shoot back and grab it. And then you close it, send it up, go to the next one. And usually yeah. like, you know, if you have bad cell reception, you have to wait till you actually get home to find like good Wi-Fi connection to actually upload everything. But as far as the estimate goes, I do all the photos. I write the GLR and I write the entire estimate like basically on site, just not in the you know customer's driveway. But that way, everything's fresh in my head. Now, when I get a little bit lazier and I'm doing day claims like I have been the last four months, you know, sometimes I'll go and inspect like two or three and then just go home and I can write everything up like the next day if I wanted to. I try to get them all done within like you inspect and you either close that day or the next day, even though most companies have like a seven day turnaround or whatever it is. But the quicker you do it, obviously, it, it just is that much faster. Now, if I like inspect something and I wait like three days, I feel like it takes me almost twice as long to write up the estimate because it's not fresh in my head, you know? Right. For sure. For sure. And they're, they're watching those metrics. I mean, the, the faster from inspected to close you are like, because mm-hmm. they don't want people like the claim sitting on people's desks, which is most adjusters. They, because they'll mm-hmm. do that. They'll scope. And I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that you, you, you at least, at the, I'm sure at the minimum, you just throw the photos in there, but, um, not everybody does it that way. Most, I think most adjusters don't do it that way because that's like the, the conventional wisdom is it's like, well, if it's the sun's out, then I need to be up on a roof or, or, and at night, then I can write them up or whatever. But they always, I think what happens with those guys, I know what happens with those guys is that they, they'll scope six to eight or 10 and then they'll say, well, I'll write these up tonight. And then they write four. And then they do that mm-hmm. every day and they get, they start snowballing and start getting behind. And it's, it's when people go on these big hurricanes and they talk to, or they talk to people on social media or they, or they talk to guys at orientation, like, oh yeah, well, I'm just going to get out there and scope and write them up at night. I'm going to scope like some guys, I'm going to scope everything this week. And then I'm going to go home and write them up. Uh, uh, have, you heard, have you heard guys? Yeah. Really that? That. Yeah. They do it. And then that's how they get in over their head. And then they just get so far behind where then they start getting their claims pulled from them. And you don't want that either. You know, I've talked to a few different reviewers and uh, and whatnot. And I swear they have like a little black book of all all the stuff that every adjuster does. Like this one's hard to deal with. This one has a temper. This one takes way too long to get their uh, information back. Or this one you can't even reach half the time. So like if you're not reachable, nobody's going to want to work with you, you know? I'll tell you what, there's no black book. It's just right here. Oh, there's Jeff Smith. Oh, crap, this guy. You know, you're gonna send <laughs> yeah. back you're gonna send back thirty seven corrections and he's gonna ignore you. Or he'll do two and send mm-hmm. the send the file back up. It's, it takes a week to get all thirty seven of them done. I've done a lot of file reviews, so and you and you like you recognize people by you recognize them by name, right? So then you see this other person, Mary Sue. Yeah. And she's knocks it out of the park. Everything's, I don't even have to look at her file. I know it's going to be pin perfect. All the photos are there. Everything's spelled correctly. It's, you know, there's no like blanks where there should be depreciation in their F9 note because they have a macro that's got a blank there. Uh, Or their GLR, they forgot to like, you know, delete the other person's insured information. So it has like other, it has a different claim number on the GLR. Yeah, yeah, totally. So this, and this is, I think it's a function of experience. It's a function of, um, you know, it's kind of seeing, getting your hands into the repetition of everything and getting that, building that muscle memory. And you start to see, all right, well, 
I'm putting together the exactimate piece, the scoping piece, the photo piece, the contact piece, right? And those are the big pieces, you know. And then as you go, you start to like hone things down and and build workflows into everything so that you can be a lot more efficient with everything and be faster and faster and faster, but still keeping the same level of quality or higher and Correct. having, you know, the, the customer feels like they got a fair shake from you. You know, if, if you're getting a, uh, like a QA performance review thing, there's not like a consistently you're making everybody mad because you're, you know, you're just not a, don't have good bedside manner. Or you're not thinking about them before yourself. Um, the managers notice that the carrier notices that the carrier says, you know, you know, when they call, you know, all cat or pilot or whoever, and they say, Hey, we, you know, we've got a big storm and wherever, and we need, you know, 150 adjusters and it'd be great if 40 of them were these people on this list, they're the ones that keep that first call list. So the faster you can turn those files around, keep that quality up. Um, you know, I would tell you, and I'm, you know, I wasn't giving all that advice to you necessarily, but this one I might suggest, depending on, you know, the reason why you're pulling out of the insurance driveway and going around the corner. I stay right in front of the insurance house because invariably what happens, it's, and it saves me phone calls. If they, if I'm sitting in front of the insurance house, I'm, I'm importing and labeling photos and I'm writing the estimate diary, GLR, whole nine yards, till it's, it's, I can hit the complete button and then just when I get back to the hotel, hook up to the internet it goes up right if i'm sitting there writing that up they'll come out they'll run out to the driveway and tap on my window hey i remember when you asked me when you got here if i if if we if we have we we saw any like uh water damage on the inside and we said no well we actually we, we, we thought about it and we went and looked and we did find one do you mind taking a look at it we found something in the, the room or the grill cover was actually, we found it. It was, you know, one of the kids was playing with it and it was stuffed under the something in the garage and it's got holes in it. You get a picture of it. That saves me a full phone tag. And it's a small thing. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, you're right. I mean, if you're sitting in front of the house and you forgot a photo, this is the biggest thing. Or if you got a measurement, right? Oh, mm. shit, I didn't get those, those awnings on the back. What was that? And then you're guessing, right? Well, that looks like four foot and that one looks exactly. like two foot. And, and then and your I never estimate even starts of that. to That's get. That's actually a pretty good idea. Because then yeah. they'd be like, why is he out in front? And just be like, I'm going to finish the estimate. Then they're actually happy. They're going to be like, oh, wow, that's awesome. He's going to finish it right now so that, you know, oh, yeah. the company will have it within the day. So that's actually and you, listen, idea. you can make that you can make that part of your spiel. You know, I'm going to, you know, thank you so much, everything. I don't know if you write the estimate, go up and go you know, settle up with them or not, which, whichever way. I would say, hey, yeah, I'm just going to, don't mind me. I'll just be sitting down there at the end of the driveway and I'm going to write this thing up. And uh, <laughs> before I drive off, your file will be done and it'll be on to the next step. So if you have any questions, give mm -hmm. me a call. Here's my card. Boom. I like that. I might have to do that. Yeah, that's a that's a customer service win. I think that's probably more effective than sending Christmas cards or thank you postcards or whatever that people say. Well, I, yep. I send all my insurance a thank you card. I think that's good a good point. idea. But I, I think that doing it, you know, telling them that they're on to the next step already instead of having to wait because they don't want to wait for anything. Right. And that's, you know, you talk about uncertainty and anxiety there. If they have to wait and they don't know how long they have to wait for, then mm -hmm. the anxiety level just cranks. I mean, it's, and they're, that's when they start calling their agent, even if it's been two days or whatever, if yeah. they know, even if you, even if you don't do that, even if you don't close it on site and you don't say, I want to, it'll be on to the next, I wouldn't lie. Cause you never know. You might get, they wouldn't say that you're going to do that and not do it. Mm -hmm. But even if you're like, you know, I, I scope these on this day and then I write them up, you know, the evening and I should have it done within 24 hours of, of our meeting today. And then it'll be move, moved on to the next step. And if you haven't, if you don't hear anything uh -huh. from anybody within you know, a week or if you, you know, I'm going to call you before five o'clock on Friday, whatever it is, set an expectation for the homeowner um, so that they know where they're at. Always. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, depending on you know, obviously what kind of storm you're working or if, if they're like, just go out and photo and scope and we'll take care of everything, then it's kind of out of your hands. But, you know, the best claims, I think, are the ones where you get full responsibility for the whole thing. And, you know, you're even if you're having to write checks, I mean, like you said, you can build that into your system and everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So any uh, any any final thoughts for, you know, for new folks or maybe experienced adjusters, um, you know, people that are kind of wanting to take things to the next level or get started? Well, again, it's, it's certainly not a, an easy industry to get into and learn, but uh, if you're willing to put in the effort in the work, 
I mean, it can be incredibly profitable and it can literally set you up. You can have a career and is in less than like two years. If you really wanted to like put in the effort, like, again, I wouldn't quit your day job, but if you wanted to get your license and start working and do it part time and then continue growing and getting all your skills, I mean, within a year or two, you could have a career easy. No problem, you know, again, but you have to be willing to put in the work. My first month, I think I wanted to quit. I was overwhelmed almost every day. I'm like, there's no yeah. way. How am I going to do all this? Like, it's, it's incredibly overwhelming. But as you keep doing it, it just gets easier and quicker. And I mean, it, it really is. And I mean, now I'm completely out of construction. I've been down here four months. I've just been doing day claims for AllCat. And they keep me super busy, as busy as I want, to the point where I have to be like, all right, I need like a week off because I haven't had a day. So, I mean, I'll take some time off. But I mean, again, five years I've been doing this and I did a lot of construction during that time. So I think it's a great industry for young kids, especially in their 20s and 30s, because a lot of the guys that I meet, all the adjusters are always a lot older, you know, and it, I, I feel like it's it's if we can get a lot of the younger crew in this, everybody works off of each other and everybody can help each other out. You know, it's like a teamwork game. For sure. For sure. Well, listen, Steve, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I, I think your insights are going to help people for sure. And I, I know when we talked via email, you know, you, you felt like you, you had some things to share. And I, I, this is, I think this has been a really cool conversation. So thank you so much for coming on, man. Trust me, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You uh, keep doing what you're doing because you guys are spreading a lot of knowledge out there and you're going to get a lot of people involved. So anybody in the Nashville area, send them my way. I'd be more than happy to take them on a ride along. They can be my driver or even pay them. Hey, yeah, all right. There you go. <laughs> cool, man. Well, listen, have a good one and uh, we'll catch up with you later. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. Take it easy. We'll see you. IA firms are hiring. Find out what they're looking for in this video titled What IA Firms Are Looking For in New Adjusters, which is a Crawford and Company interview. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great storm. Adjuster TV. What are your other two wishes?